See, the green line was there 50 years ago. So the green line is maybe a nice piece of paper in the UN, but it doesn't really mean anything for a regular general Israeli. Today, there's about a million people of Israel. You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Bill Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com where we are only two weeks before the exciting election that will be happening over here in Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been having a lot of fun covering this election here on Inside Israel Today and and, uh, just living it over here, Um, watching our democratic process in action. And uh, this election has been about a lot of different things. Uh, This election has been about corruption. This election has been about mistakes made uh, about uh, submarines, about cell phones. For a few days anyway, it looked like this election would be about the legalization of cannabis out of all things. And then yesterday morning, 5.20 in the morning, Israel got a terrible wake-up call with a direct hit of a missile on the home uh, in the hardest community to find in, in north of Farsaba, um, 80 kilometers away from Gaza, uh, Mishmeret, a little itty bitty place. I, I've never been there, and 90 um, something percent of Israelis have never been there. You don't even see a sign for it on the highway. So, for this little itty bitty place to make the news, uh, whether the missile was fired on purpose or not fired on purpose, um, this changes everything. Netanyahu had to shorten his trip to the United States and to come back and um, be in charge of the uh, retaliation that there will be. So far, what there's been has been minimal, um, in part because they did say it was a mistake, but also in part because Netanyahu is not here and he's the prime minister and the defense minister. And either the prime minister or the defense minister has to sign on doing something. Um, and uh, so as we speak, he's still on his way back. And anything can happen, ladies and gentlemen. These two weeks could be two weeks where the security situation dominates the headlines. Netanyahu is a very fine line to be walking on right now because on the one hand, he can't be perceived as weak. He has every politician who's not in Likud across the political spectrum accusing him of of, uh, not being hard enough on on Hamas. Uh, That includes the left. And uh, we've got... Unlike past elections, he's got three chiefs of staff of the IDF running against him who can all say, we can do it better than him, but be clean. And on the other hand, Netanyahu also has to not go too far because uh, if you let things escalate, they retaliate too. And uh, that results in people on our side being killed. And the last thing a a prime minister needs is, is Israelis killed ahead of an election. Let's not forget that's how Netanyahu came to power in the first place. In 1996, against Shimon Peres, when buses were blowing up in Tel Aviv, um, that made people say, "Well, I want something different," and uh, this election has something different. Now, that something different is Benny Gantz, and he also is facing tests right now, as I wrote in today's Jerusalem Post. Um, everyone was looking ahead to that speech at APAC. Can he put on a show like Netanyahu can? And the answer is absolutely not. No one can be BB. Uh, Bibi's a showman. Uh, Bibi speaks better than mother tongue English. Bibi makes fun of my English when I interview him. He says my English is better than yours. Um, that's just not fair. Okay, no, you can't compete with him. Um, but the truth is, uh, the speech that Gantz gave uh, at the APAC policy conference was very nice. Uh, he spoke English fine, and you know, uh, I'd put, take off marks here and there for pronouncing things incorrectly and uh, saying things in, in singular instead of plural and plural instead of singular. Okay, he's not a native is English speaker. People get it. Um, but he came across, uh, expressed uh, everything he wanted to say, he hit all the check marks on, on what you're supposed to say when you're speaking to uh, American Jews. Um, told even a couple jokes, uh, appeared to be uh, charming and um, to have uh, charisma and even uh, grace. He walked around. It, it didn't look like he was speaking from a teleprompter. Maybe he was. It's okay. Um, 
and uh, I came across as, as comfortable, which was interesting because uh, you would expect him to be uncomfortable uh, speaking before 18,000 people in a foreign language. And then five hours later, Benny Gantz, after passing that test, goes and fails another one. When he gave an interview to Channel 2, to the regular, very high-rated nightly news in Israel. And it was the same Yonit Levy anchor woman who interviewed him the week before and asked him no tough questions. Here, she asked only tough questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I give a lot of interviews myself about Israel to the foreign press. If you ask me the same question twice, it's a little annoying, but I can do it. If you ask me the same question three times, it's a challenge, but I can do it. If you ask me the same question four times, it's really, really hard, and I don't know if I can do it. You ask me the same question a fifth time in a row, it's impossible. That's what happened yesterday to Benny Gantz. Yonit Levy asked him, how would your policies on the Gaza situation be different than Netanyahu? And the first time she asked him, he already didn't have an answer. And she hammered and hammered and asked again and asked again and asked again. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, ask yourself any question five times. You don't have five different answers. Uh, how, what did you eat for lunch? How do you feel? What's the weather like? You can't answer that question five times. Now, how about a tough question that you failed at the first time? Now ask it four more times. He looked horrible. He was drowning out there. And then 20 minutes later, he gave an interview to the other channel, the second highest rated show, uh, to the channel 13 News. And there, their anchor woman was Tali Moreno, who he called Tamar because she's the regular anchor. Tamar, uh, Tamar was still it was stationed in the where the the rocket was, so uh, she wasn't there in in, in the studio. Uh, and uh, so you already got the name wrong. Okay, that, that that's a little faux pas. You can you can get over that. She asked him about a headline the day before, that was on her newscast the day before, which said that in a private conversation, Gantz was making fun of Netanyahu and said, "If the man could have me killed, he would." Now that's a pretty controversial thing to say. In any election, right? In any country, if my opponent could have me killed, he would. Have an explanation because you're interviewing on the same network that reported that you said that the day before. Obviously, you need to explain that. He wasn't ready, ladies and gentlemen, to answer the obvious question that he knows he's going to be asked. And Tali, who I think was upset about being called Tamar, she asked it again when she didn't like his non-answer, and again and again. And I'm thinking, poor guy. I mean, you could like him, not like him as a human being, like his policies, not like his policies, not understand what they are. Fine, but he's a human being. And you're watching the man drowning for the second time in half an hour, and you just think, have mercy on the fellow. Send the man a, a, a life preserver or something. He's running for prime minister against a man who speaks beautifully and who, although he has, didn't give an interview for four years to the mainstream Israeli media, certainly knows how to handle media interviews that are tough. And then Likud put out a statement afterwards saying uh, that if he can't handle the pressure of a media interview, then, then how is he going to handle Iran? Uh, which was a point. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, after those interviews, Gantz ends up going down in the polls. Keep in mind, the people of Israel did not watch the speech at APAC. The people of Israel don't watch speeches in English at 3.30 in the afternoon Israel time. They watch the news at night. And they had maybe 15 seconds of his speech at APAC. And the, those two interviews that did him, uh, I'd like to think, a lot of damage. And uh, we remember Isaac Herzog in the previous election, the candidate against Netanyahu, 
spoke beautifully most of the time, but the Saturday night before the election, he said a little mistake. Instead of saying he wanted to keep Jerusalem united, he said he wanted to keep Netanyahu united. Okay, that's a throwaway line that he screwed up. Anybody could do that. But it happened the Saturday night before the election, and no one has forgotten it. He said it with Netanyahu in the same studio, not in the same studio sitting next to him, but in a, in a video uh, on top of him looking much larger than him. And uh, that created a certain impression about him not being ready to be prime minister, of Netanyahu being larger than life and everybody being small compared to him. And uh, that might have happened again here uh, but there's still two weeks left Netanyahu can still screw up the security situation could get out of control God forbid Gantz could do things right anything can happen and that's the beauty of Israeli democracy stay with us because after the break we will get back to our meet the candidate series uh, which uh, is uh, nearing its end ahead of this election so stay tuned Tune in for an exclusive interview with Mayor of Efrat, Oded Revivi, the first official representative from Judea and Samaria to speak at the APAC conference. He said, I don't agree with Oded. I don't come from the same political background. But the way he presented the information, the way he showed us reality, is an important thing that should be on the stage in the main conference. For the full interview, check out Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. And we're back here on Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. We have been using this wonderful pulpit over here on on, uh, the, the internet to introduce people around the world to the fascinating people who are running for Knesset here on April 9th. Uh, I started this Meet the Candidate series uh, all the way back uh, two and a half months ago in uh, January. And uh, when I started it, I had no idea where I would go and who I would interview. And I think, in my humble opinion, that it has been fascinating. Uh, We started out with Tahila Friedman from the Yeshatid Party, which has since united with blue and white and she's about 40 she is 40th on the list on blue and white right now um uh in a party getting uh 30 something seats in the polls and if uh, you have uh what's called the norwegian law implemented where uh, all the ministers quit the knesset then uh, she would be in and we have the likuds uh uzi dayan a former general who's 42nd on the likud list and with that norwegian law would be in the knesset after april 9th we have Meretz, the number six candidate on the list, Mehereta Baruch Ron, who is an immigrant from Ethiopia, we spoke to. Uh, she very well might be in the Knesset as well. Baruch Marzel, we interviewed. Uh, the show's called The View from All the Way on the Right. He's from Otsma Yudit. Uh, he was not put on the list in the end. They decided to run Michael Ben-Ari and Baruch and, uh, Itamar ben and Michael ben was since then prohibited from running by the Supreme Court. And as a result of that, the Otsma Yudit party that's running as part of the Union of Right-Wing Parties says that they are demanding that Baruch Marzel be appointed a minister. So you have not heard the last of him. Uh, then we went to the left. We went to the Labor Party. We interviewed Yaya Fink, who is the religious candidate uh, running in labor. He's 12th on the list and uh, wants to change the way people see Judaism. And then we had Carolyn Glick from the New Right, who is uh, sixth on that list. She is Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked's recruit from the Jerusalem Post. And uh, she was the main speaker at a pro Trump rally in Jerusalem, but here. She was critical of the peace plan that Trump is supposed to be revealing sometime after the Israeli election. And then we interviewed Yisrael Beitin, who's number four candidate, Eli Avidar, former diplomat. We interviewed the number two candidate in Orly 
Levy's party, Gesher, uh, David Daddy Perlmutter, who uh, went from running a $50 billion company in Intel to uh, running for Knesset. And then last week, we spoke to Runit Dror, the advocate for men's rights, who is number four on the Zehut party list of Moshe Feiglin. And so there aren't a lot of parties left that have a chance of making it into the Knesset. Uh, one of them is Shas. And I was told there's a brilliant guy. He's seventh on the Shas list. He has uh, a law degree. And he has a rabbinical degree. And he has a business degree. And he went to a program and received a certificate at Harvard. He, of course, can do an interview in English. I spoke to him this morning, and ladies and gentlemen, he chickened out. He said, I'm happy to give an interview in Hebrew, but I will not be giving an interview in English ahead of the election. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have Hebrew on the Land of Israel network. There are plenty of radio stations in Israel and Hebrew. If you know Hebrew, listen to them. This is an English radio network, and uh, cowardice is not a good trait to have if you are running for Knesset. So uh, that makes me all the more impressed by who we are interviewing today, the 10th candidate from 10 different parties running in the April 9th election to be interviewed here on Inside Israel today from the United Torah Judaism Party, which is an ultra-Orthodox Ashkenazi party of a European Hasidic and uh, non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodox Jews led by Yaakov Litzman and Moshe Kaf- Gafni in the Knesset. So we have on the line Yitzchak Pindrus, who is the former deputy mayor of Jerusalem, the former mayor of Beitar Elite, and who is eighth on the list of United Torah Judaism, uh, which is getting seven seats in the polls. Uh, but we have a mini Norwegian law where usually a, a minister or a deputy minister quits, which means if elections happen today, then Mr. Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak Pindrus is in the Knesset. Thank you for coming here on Inside Israel today. Thank you for having me. So uh, why are you running for Knesset? First of all, why am I running for Knesset? I've uh, been in the uh, public service for the last uh, 25 years, and uh, uh, I served in the municipality for uh, 25 years, and I think uh, that I could uh, really, uh, at least the things that I did until now, I could be doing uh, better in the national uh, level. Where were you born? I was born in Jerusalem. What is your American connection? You, you, you speak English a little bit better than the other candidates in your my, list. My parents are American. That means I have an American citizenship, but I grew up in Jerusalem, was born in Jerusalem. And, uh, and most of my life were between Jerusalem and Beitar Elite. Tell our listeners about Beitar Elite. Not even most, it's uh, the whole life. Tell our listeners about Beitar Elite. The, it, it doesn't make the headlines very often. Beitar Elite is a city uh, south of Jerusalem. Uh, there's, uh, today, I believe there's uh, 60,000, 70,000 people living there. Uh, I moved in there when there was 30 families. I left when there was 40,000 people living there. Uh, after 17 years, uh, it was those years the fastest growing city in uh, in uh, Israel, and uh, it's an orthodox city in general, and uh, very successful, beautiful city, nice city, clean, neat. But it's it's over the green line. People don't realize how many ultra orthodox are settlers. You have to understand. First of all, it's over the green line. Is it's true, but I mean the green line was there. Uh, 50 years ago, so that people don't really pay attention today where the green line is. People don't really know where the green line is. The green line is maybe a nice piece of paper in the UN, but it doesn't really mean anything uh, for a regular general Israeli. And uh, uh, today, if you would, UN settlers is about a million people of Israel. So uh, I, I don't think it's something unique. It's uh, maybe when we started, it, it looked like a, a mountain outside over there, but today it's uh, it's in Greater Jerusalem, and it's part of uh, the area of Jerusalem, and it's a great city. Yeah, people don't realize uh, that the amount of Jews living over the Green Line, over the pre sixty seven border, is around the same population as Denver, as Seattle, as Washington D.C. 
uh, as uh, big cities in the United States. It's not only that. It's about 15% of the Israeli uh, Jewish population, at least, live over the Green Line. Now, this radio show is listened to uh, by people in Israel and by p uh, people that love Israel all around the world, uh, Jews and Christians. But I'm assuming not too many ultra-Orthodox people are, are listening to radio on the Internet. I could be wrong. Uh, but for those who are, uh, tell them why they should vote for United Torah Judaism. First of all, I don't think only Orthodox should vote for the United Torah Judaism. I think that uh, all Israelis should vote. I think it's a party that's uh, probably the only party that's there for 70 years and uh, doing a very, very terrific job in uh, uh, helping the population, um, mostly uh, things that disturb uh, normal residents of the, in the country, you know, helping uh, going through uh, less bureaucracy and more uh, rights for families, for children, for all, for elder people, and more uh, health uh, rights. I mean, these are things that United Torah Judaism has been working and that uh, Israel should be a Jewish state. I mean, those are things that I think most Jews and, of course, Israelis uh, believe in it and want it. And uh, that's the reason I think uh, uh, they should vote for them. And we know what Gaffney did for the last four and a half years as chairman of the finance uh, committee in the Knesset. Uh, uh, again, helping people, helping uh, going through uh, uh, bureaucracies, helping the, the, the system to be a lot more uh, favor for the residents of Israel. And uh, that enough would be a reason. Uh, all these companies that, that were going bankrupt and uh, closing down, uh, saving them, uh, saving people's jobs, saving people's... Uh, all these reasons are reasons why people should vote for Yadu Torah. Now, the party's gotten along very well with Netanyahu over the last decade. And now Netanyahu has a serious challenge from Benny Gantz. And yesterday when Benny spoke in APAC uh, in Washington, he said that there's more than enough room at the Western Wall for everyone. Uh, and I he, agree. There's enough room. Everybody, uh, I, I live in the old city, and I know the Western Wall, and I don't, I never heard of anyone that wasn't led into the Western Wall <laughs> and wasn't uh, led into pray, and, and then they could pray over there and uh, do whatever you want. No one checks what you're praying and how you're praying and what you're saying or what you write on your note when you put it in the wall. Uh, uh, I, I don't see any reason, you know, there's a... a Small group is trying to change the regulation who uh, runs the security over there or whatever, but nobody runs the prayers over there. Uh, every Jew that was in the Western world knows that you could walk in and lead your uh, prayer however you want, whatever you want. This whole Gantz idea is uh, something that isn't clear. We don't know what their ideas are. I'm not sure they know what their ideas are. Uh, I mean, it's a mix of left and right, religious and non-religious, and the uh, capitalists and socialists, uh, the unions and the big companies. I mean, no one really knows what they believe in, and I'm not sure they know what they believe in. And I, I, one thing is for sure. I mean, there's no way um, everybody knows how to count and calculate uh, that Gantz, uh, first of all, could at all uh, have the next government, but even he would have, he needs the orthodox parties with him. So uh, I believe that uh, he knows also that what he said yesterday at APEC doesn't make any, uh, uh, doesn't mean really anything to happen the day after the elections. That makes sense. So you, you don't, do you see a possibility uh, remotely even of, of your party joining a government with him as prime minister? I don't see him uh, being in the situation of trying to be prime minister. And again, because we prefer to go with a prime minister that first of all succeeded in the uh, in, in the international relationships of Israel, it, it succeeded in the whole uh, developing Israel. You see the roads, you see the trains, and you see uh, uh, Israel is uh, blowing financially. I mean, they're doing very, very well. To start with people, like I said before, that we have no idea what they really uh, do. The only one that we know what he does is... Uh, is Lapid, which was a, a, a terrible treasure minister in Israel. I mean, he didn't succeed over there. So I don't see any reason or any way for us to try to change uh, the system in Israel. Okay, so I guess my last question for you would be a prediction. Uh, how many seats is your party going to get on election day? Will, will you, the, your party's power continue to grow as, as ultra-Orthodox families have more children and they become uh, 18 years old and able to vote? I believe we're going to get 15% at least uh, more votes than we got last time, 15 16% more votes than we got last time. Uh, the amount of seats depends by the end of the day 
at the uh, for sure not on polls, but it depends on the uh, uh, what would be the the percentage of voters, and uh, that we can't know until the ten o'clock uh, the night of the elections how many people voted, and that really depends on that. It depends on the percentage. We know our voters. We know how many people are going to come. We believe, uh, like I said, we're going to grow sixteen percent at least. So it really depends on that. We could get to eight or nine seats, and that depends on the average uh, percentage of voters. Wonderful. It's Hak Pinders. Thank you for coming here on Inside Israel today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. Thank you, and we should have great elections. Amen. That was Yitzhak Pinders, the number eight candidate in United Torah Judaism and perhaps a Knesset member on April 9th. And there are still two weeks left, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure yet what we're doing next week. Uh, with that one week that we have left, since Shas did not agree to an interview, uh, should we have an Arab Knesset member or candidate? Should we go back to blue and white? Because I technically interviewed someone before from Yeshatid and not from Gans's party. I don't know yet. A lot of different possibilities to how to handle that last week. If you have an opinion on who I have not done yet, you can email gil at jpost.com, G-I-L at jpost.com. And uh, sometime between now and next Tuesday, we will be making a decision on the final candidate in the Meet the Candidate series. So this has been Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. Shalom from Jerusalem. Bye-bye.